Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to another program. You know, I'm so excited about this show. In the studio with us is author Dan Gracely, known for his high-rated book, Calvinism, A Closer Look. And Dan, welcome to Love for the Truth Radio. It's so great to have you on our show. Hi, Cindy. It's great to be here. You know, Dan, if you don't mind, I'd really like you to read the intro that we read on Amazon concerning your book. It says... Are you concerned or confused about the Calvinistic doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty? Many people are. Despite the widespread acceptance of Calvinism among today's evangelicals, Calvin's teaching on the sovereignty of God and the problem of evil are biblically incorrect. In fact, Calvin's views have so decimated evangelical apologetics that rational debate on the issue of divine sovereignty is hardly understood within evangelicalism anymore, even by many pastors and teachers. Furthermore, Calvinism has led to an inability to express true biblical Christianity to those outside or even inside the evangelical faith. What is offered instead is a confusing amalgam of believing in Christ and believing for believing's sake, since in the case of the unbeliever, he is asked to entrust his soul to the same caring God who is said to have foreordained all the animus of human experience, including Hitler's fascism, Stalin's communism, religions that oppose Christianity, and whatever other atrocities and contradictions history may offer. Despite all the confident-sounding rhetoric Calvinists make about keeping God safely ensconced in his own sphere of being, what has largely taken place within evangelical apologetics is complete breakdown of definition. The result is an evangelical apologetic where God is no longer distinct in his person or his moral character. You know, Dan, there are so many people out there that have been so confused about the Calvinistic doctrine. And uh, I'm really hoping and praying that we'll be able to break this down for them. I looked your book up on Amazon, and I'd like to read a few of your five-star ratings. Um, One calls your book a theological masterpiece. First and foremost, this book was a blessing to my heart and soul, and I truly believe that God will use the work to help the Christian in the 21st century who is struggling with Calvinism. I, for the life of me, can't understand how this book hasn't received more notoriety. I've not read a book that so thoroughly explains the explicit and implicit problems with Calvinistic interpretations of Scripture. I don't mean just glossing over text and offering plausible alternative solutions. No, I mean a robust, logical, hermeneutical, theological, philosophical refutation of Calvinism. If you are a Calvinist, if you are struggling with Calvinism because it appears to be true, even if you have never even heard of Calvinism, please get this book. And again, that was a five-star rating uh, by someone who put that up on Amazon. Another reader says, I just finished half your book. We'll go on reading it. This book's arguments against Calvinism are very powerful. I agree with other comments. So far, it is the best book I've ever read within this topic. Dan, uh, you know, it's amazing that so many people, again, need to know what Calvinism is about, and you're getting high ratings for this book, and I really hope that uh, by the time we're done with this program, others will be able to determine or understand what Calvinism is really about. So why don't you briefly tell our listeners why you wrote the book? Cindy, really began in Olive Garden. I was uh, having dinner with a really close friend of mine, and he was a Christian, a six-day creationist, you know, the whole bag, and he told me he no longer believed in inerrancy. And uh, I, didn't try, I tried not to show him my alarm, but uh, not too long after that, I went to see one of the pastors at my church. And I said, look, this is where my friend is at. I'm very concerned for him. You know, is there a book you would suggest? And he suggested Jerry Bridges' book, Trusting God Even When It Hurts. So I got the book, and I started reading it, and it just seemed so bizarre that I told my brother, you know, we really need to make some kind of refutation of this book. This is just so off the wall. I can't believe it. Of course, I was so abhorred by it that I never gave it to my friend, and it would just further damage uh, where he was at. In fact, one of the three reasons that he listed as why he left the faith was Calvinist theology. So, Dan, um, that provoked you then to look more into Calvinism because your friend was thinking different. Was he a believer before this? 
I, I believe he was. Yeah. And uh, there are a few other things that were going on in his life. He had a very close relative who was facing a life-threatening illness, eventually did pass away. And, uh, you know, another personal uh, relationship in his life that went sour, like they happen in each one of our lives. But uh, this combination of all these things really kind of threw him. And I don't think he had the kind of uh, support around him that I feel I've had or I often feel that if our positions were reversed, I would be where he is and he would be where I am. And, you know, Dan, I know that previously we, we had spoken, you told me about a personal journey uh, as to why, also why you wrote this book. Can you share that personal journey with the audience? Um, yeah, I was a Calvinist myself, uh, not at the beginning. I was raised in a Methodist Baptist background. But I uh, went to Geneva College, which gave me a very good education. But in the course of it, they are reformed. And I came under the influence of Calvinism, and I accepted it because I believed it was biblical. It certainly seemed to be what the Bible taught. And I was probably a Calvinist from roughly the time I was 22 to the time I was maybe 30 or 31. I specifically remember being in a class of graduate school. I was, I was at that point, I was 30, 31, in a class about American transcendentalists, authors from the 1840s, that period, Herman Melville, Emily Dickinson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and so forth, and their reaction against Calvinism. And at the time, I was still a Calvinist, and this very fair-minded Jewish agnostic professor encouraged me to share my view because it was the view against which all these authors railed against. And so, unfortunately, uh, I made my best pitch for Calvinism then, and of course, I've always regretted that. You know, Dan, um, I'd like to share with the audience uh, a few of the chapters that in your book. Um, I think this will uh, be eye-openers for some of our listeners. Um, in Dan's book, A Closer Look at Calvinism, we find a chapter like the free freedom of will. Another chapter says, does God control everyone's heart? Uh, does God rule over and in everything? And defining double think. You know, these are, um, the chapters of this book are actually questions that I've heard people having all the time concerning Calvinism, like the freedom of will. Do we have our own will? Or does God change our will inside him? I know we're going to be talking about that later on, but uh, what are some of uh, or your favorite chapters in the book? Well, the hardest chapter for me to write was called The Freedom of the Will. I had to deal with a number of issues I didn't feel I'd been dealt with. Uh, and it was difficult. It took me a very long time, and it was very emotionally draining as all, if I can say so, original research seems to be. In the end, I found some of it was not as original as I had thought. For example, Romans 5.12 is in the form of a correlative conjunction. That has enormous ramifications about the doctrine of original sin. And I found that other people thought about that too. But, you know, when you're sort of working alone, you don't always uh, find these things out until later. Um, and I think one of the other favorite chapters I have is probably the one that talks about my being on a rocking horse as a Calvinist. And by this, I mean, when you're on the rocking horse, uh, it means that you're, you keep espousing the sovereignty of God and you're throwing yourself forward on the rocking horse until you've gone so far, you're almost ready to tip over. So then you suddenly jerk back and you start talking about the freedom of man. And then you do that to the extent where you're afraid that you're jeopardizing the sovereignty of God. So then you start uh, talking about the sovereignty of God again. And so you go back and forth on this rocking horse uh, where the springs are always keeping you in tension and you're always really sort of undoing what you just said. And so in the end, you really don't say anything, but you think you have. And then finally, you just sort of exhaust yourself with the argument. You allow the springs of the rocking horse to bring you to the center. You say, hey, everything's okay. See, uh, everything's stable. This is stable theology. And you get off and you think you're okay and you're really not. Can you give us an example? Uh, yeah, I think one of the th interesting statements that R.C. Sproul says is that uh, Augustine got at the problem of total depravity by saying that man is free, but he has no liberty. Now, uh, we all live in New Jersey, Cindy, you, Rich, and I, and it's the nation with the highest property taxes. So I can imagine if the governor of New Jersey came up to my door and he knocked on the door and he said, and I opened it, he said, Dan, <clears throat> if he said, Dan, your property is free from taxes, and yet your property is not at liberty from taxes. And I would probably pause and say, okay, so I don't have to pay taxes? And he'd say, well, I said, and yet your, your property is not at liberty from taxes. 
And I would think a little bit and say, okay, so you're saying I do have to pay taxes. And he'd say, no, look, let me repeat myself in its entirety. Your property is free from taxes, yet your property is not at liberty from taxes. So in the end, you see, the terms are unconcluded, free and liberty. Now, in real language, they mean the same thing. They are synonyms. But what Calvinism does is they treat, this, they treat them as antonyms. And so they undo language and they undo meaning. So in the most truest sense, there is no meaning being conveyed by the Calvinism, but you think it is because you can conceive of the idea of a man being free and you can conceive of a man not being in liberty. And you sort of held these two thoughts that really contradict each other in your mind. And so you think something's being said. In fact, nothing is being said. So would this apply to your chapter, The Freedom of Will? The Freedom of the Will is... uh, really more or less an exposition of Romans 5, 12 to 21. It involves the doctrine of original sin. It's probably controversial to most evangelicals, so I probably won't get into it here. But uh, I felt that in the end, as a, that as, as a non-Calvinist, I really could not argue that I sin because I'm a sinner. Rather, we're a sinner because we sin. And I, I came down hard on that position. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I think we're going we're gonna to move... Uh, forward, what I'd like you to do, Dan, is uh, begin to explain, briefly explain what the doctrine of five-point Calvinism is by explaining the acronym, meaning of TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. Basically, if you can start with that, that would be great, so we can get an idea of what we're talking about here. Let me first state the five. Um, They do spell the word TULIP, like Mm -hmm. the flower TULIP. Mm -hmm. T is for total depravity. U is for unconditional election. L is for limited atonement. R, I'm sorry, I is for irresistible grace. And P is for perseverance of the saints. Um, total depravity is, sort of depends on, uh, I should say, the, the definition that Calvinists give of total depravity really depends on what Calvinists you read. For example, R.C. Sproul says that man is not as so depraved that it couldn't be imagined he could do even worse things. So Sproul doesn't take a real hard line on it. But uh, a Calvinist of a couple generations ago named Lorraine Bittner said that if it wasn't for the common grace of God, man would be as absolutely bad as he can be. So the question is, which is he? So even among Calvinists, there's this dis- disagreement. Is man as bad as he can be, or is he not as bad as he can be? So it really depends on what Calvinist you're reading. Uh, as for unconditional election, this is confusing too, because some Calvinists will say, well, God predestines that some are saved, and he passes over others. And yet, when you read other people, they're very adamant that it's not merely a passing over that God does of the unbeliever, that he, he hardens their hearts. He, as B.B. Warfield would say, uh, that God creates the very thoughts and intents of the heart. So following that logic, uh, a man would not be able to, an unbeliever would not be able to do anything other than accept the thoughts that God creates in his mind and his heart, and if they're damning thoughts, then he's damned. And so he's certainly not just merely passed over, which is a mealy mouth way of putting it. He's absolutely condemned for all eternity, irresistibly, and man can't do anything against it. So again, it depends on what Calvinist author you're, you're reading at the time. Limited atonement, there's confusion there too, but we'll talk about that in a moment. We're going on a break. We'll be right back with Dan Gracely. Please stay tuned. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. If you're a first-time listener, you'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views from a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. So please, take everything you hear on this radio program to study and prayer, and thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host. And with us is Daniel Gracely, author of Calvinism, A Closer Look. And Dan, I want you to continue. We left off in the last segment. You were talking about the acronym of TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, is which uh, what we would call the five-point 
Cal- or doctrine of five point Calvinism, but you're a- actually explaining the acronym meaning of TULIP now. And then we're going to go back and explain to the audience what that kind of means on a more basic terms. But uh, we left off on limited atonement. Yeah, so we've covered uh, briefly total depravity and unconditional election. The next one is limited atonement. And the idea here from the Calvinist standpoint is that Christ only died for those who ultimately would believe. He didn't die for the whole world. Now, that's not what 1 John teaches because in 1 John it uses the word world 22 times. And uh, of, it includes, at one point it says that Christ is the savior of the world. And in all the other 21 instances, it's very clear that the world means all the world, not simply the world of the elect. For instance, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, But the idea of limited atonement is that God just died for those who ultimately, Christ just died for who ultimately would believe. And uh, Calvin himself talks about God inviting whosoever uh, will and so forth. And uh, I was looking that up on the internet a day or two ago, and I noticed that a seminary graduate from what I believe is a Calvinist uh, sort of led seminary, he said uh, that Calvin in no way uh, advocates limited atonement because Calvin uh, does not believe the atonement is efficacious for all. Well, of course he says that because Calvinists are always talking out of both sides of the mouth. I certainly did it as a Calvinist. I talked as with a forked tongue, didn't really realize it. As Paul says of false teachers in general, they don't even realize what they're espousing. And that's what happens when you're espousing Calvinist. So that's limited atonement, the idea that uh, Christ didn't die for everyone, but just those who he elected. Um, I stands for irresistible grace. And the idea here is that God irresistibly draws you, that you can't do anything really about it, whether or not God's going to draw you or not going to draw you. And those he draws, he draws irresistibly. That is, you can't fight it. He just changes your desire, uh, and, and you're, you're drawn in, into a salvation. That's it. Uh, it's interesting because R.C. Sproul gives two analogies of a man getting saved in his book, Chosen by God. The first analogy he gives earlier on in the book is about a a man who he says is drowned at the bottom of the lake, absolutely drowned, completely helpless, emotionless, basically, and God has to dive into the bottom of the lake, bring this man up, put him on the lake's uh, river, uh, put him on the lake's bed, so to speak, and has to resuscitate him to life. And yet, in another passage, when R.C. Sproul is talking about a regeneration, he says that God changes a man's desire whereupon, quote, man rushes to Christ, unquote. So the question that naturally arises is, how is it possible that on the one hand, a drowned man has to be resuscitated, and yet on the other hand, uh, salvation is described as man rushing to Christ. You can't be at the same time resuscitated, merely resuscitated, and on the other hand, be rushing to Christ. They're conflicting analogies. It doesn't make any sense. But that's how uh, R.C. Sproul views the salvational process. The last one is P in TULIP, and that stands for Perseverance of the Saints. And uh, this is something that even Harold Camping uh, would say that he wasn't sure. He he couldn't say with absolute certainty that he was saved, because how did he really know whether God would irresistibly uh, keep him saved until the day he died? He really didn't know, so... All this theology that he had and views that he had and still really wasn't certain of his salvation and really couldn't be. And uh, that rounds out the tulip. Yeah, it does. And you know what? I want to back up a little bit here, Dan, um, because this is the very beginning and the foundation is the T, the total depravity. You, you, You explained it really nicely, but, you know... What they're saying here, Calvinists are saying, or that man is so totally depraved that he can't even make a decision for God at all. Is that correct? That's what Sproul suggests when he uses the drowned man analogy. But as we see, it's actually what Sproul uh, actually contradicts when he talks about man rushing to Christ. So when mm-hmm. when you ask a Calvinist what he's saying, he uh, has to say these two conflicting things. And the reason ultimately that is, is because he has this tension of trying to always say that God is sovereign over everything completely, blah, 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 blah. But he knows that's going to land him into problems with evil and who's responsible for evil. And that's why on the one hand, Sproul, in order to talk about the sovereignty of God, has to talk about a drowned man and that God has to resuscitate him to life. That's That's the forward rock on the rocking horse. That's uh, that's talking about the sovereignty of God. 
And then man rushing to Christ, well, that's trying to show that man has some ability to choose and some ability to do something, because if Sproul didn't include that, well, then he would be left with God being responsible for sin ultimately. It's subtle. It's underneath everything. That's why there's these contradictions that are out there. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at my grandchildren, all right, I have uh, from eight years old down to two, um, I see the two-year-old or the four-year-old, they know when they do something wrong. There's a conviction there. There's a sense that God has put into, into man of knowing uh, what's right and what's wrong. And I, and I think to say that man is totally depraved, that they can't even think for themselves, which is the very, I believe, the foundation of Calvinism, it just seems like the foundation itself is, is off. Am I correct on that? I, I, uh, I think so. I, uh, you know, as for children, it, it, even babies, people say, oh, you can just look at a baby and you can see how selfish he is. And so it's just so obvious that he's inherited Adam's sin nature and that he can't help the sin and so forth and so on. Listen, even, even animals do wrong. I've had lots of pets and, you know, if they get up on the table and you come into the room, they know full well they're not supposed to be on the table, that they've done something wrong. But we know that God's not going to send a cat to hell. Um, some people might think that, but... Uh, we know that doesn't happen, and similarly with young children, uh, there's a certain uh, there's a certain age of accountability, I believe, where it kicks in, where God takes the sin more seriously, and there's going to be more serious consequences. We know when the children of Israel left that God didn't hold ten uh, year olds and twelve year olds and fourteen year olds responsible for their decisions. Those who saw the miracles of God and ultimately did not go into Kadesh Barnea were around 18 or 19 when they saw the miracles that God were do was doing. And so God held them liable, but he didn't hold those who were younger than that liable. So to some extent, God overlooks transgressions, and Proverbs says it's the glory of a man to overlook a transgression. I don't think that that means that God overlooks all sin, but I think it does mean that he overlooks things. Even the New Testament says that God winked at sin in the Old Testament. So there's that principle, I think, of the age of accountability that's, that's on the table. Mm -hmm. Why don't we move forward, Dan? I want to elaborate on the problem with Calvinists insinuating that only certain people are chosen for salvation. Um, you know, uh, I know previously being involved in a five-point Calvinist church, I heard the words sovereign God, election, and chosen uh, thrown around in almost every conversation. Uh, which oftentimes seem to be used as a scapegoat, uh, I believe, or scapegoat words for people's personal sinful lifestyles. You know, um, I'll give you an example. I know that there was, a, my girlfriend was attending a Bible study, a woman's Bible study, and the woman there was praying for her son's salvation. But she was told outright that her son may not be chosen or predestined to save, be saved. And so here this poor woman is crying hysterically, asking the other woman, do you mean to tell me that my son, even though I pray for him, may not be chosen to be saved? And every person stood up and walked out of the room, except for my girlfriend, because they did not know how to answer that, or they did wow. not want to answer that. And so, of course, my girlfriend said, no, you know what, the, the, the Lord died for whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, and that to keep praying for her son's salvation, and that God hears our prayers. But can you imagine, I mean, there was so much going on in that Five Point Calvinist church that uh, they were actually handing out papers in the Sunday school uh, telling the children that, that they may not be chosen. And I think that was the point that we left, of course, because it was coming through the back door into more of into the Bible studies and into the um, the Sunday schools, and and we didn't see it as much, you know, on Sunday uh, with the main message. But this is what we're talking about here, and I know that I remember listening to Howard Camping one time, and this person called and said, "How can I be saved?" And he actually said, uh, you may not be saved. I can't tell if you can be saved or not. Only God knows whether you're saved. And so he didn't offer a prayer or offer the message of salvation to this poor person. And, 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 and the person was basically in tears and weeping, you know, because they called in to find out how can I be saved and can you pray with me? And he did not give that answer. So we see that we bring this down to a level that Calvinism uh, is, is a doctrine that really opposes I believe opposes uh, 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, one thing I do know, Dan, is that um, John Calvin, he was a French theologian. He was a pastor and reformer in Geneva during the Pro Protestant Reformation. Uh, his goal was to refute Catholicism and break free from its control. He became a principal figure in the development of the system of Christian theology, but some, however, have taken his argument, I believe, that was originally based on refuting Cal Catholicism and making five-point Calvinism to be the gospel. Now, I know from uh, a friend, pastor friend of ours, he said that when we make a truth to be the truth, it then becomes a lie. And that was a quote from apologist Jacob Prash. So, you know, here we see that, that the, um, the intent Part of the intent, maybe not all of it, was to refute Catholicism, but uh, and I guess in putting together this uh, acronym of TULIP, uh, which in context, taken out of context, it really turns into a doctrine that uh, is very limited to um, to offer salvation to anybody. But anyway, why don't we move on to, uh, again, can you elaborate a little more on the problem with uh, certain people being called chosen? I mean, at a practical level, I had the same yeah. experience. I was a yeah. graduate student in music at Duquesne University, and there was a there was a young woman there. I'll call her Susan, and we used to try and share the gospel with her, and and she would listen, and eventually she would say, "But what if I'm not one of the chosen?" Because she knew we were Calvinists. All of us were Calvinists, and we never really had an answer for that. And I felt so bad about it. And I I don't think she was just mocking us. I I think it was at least half of her was it was just genuine. She was mm -hmm. like, "Well, what if I'm not chosen? Then none of this matters. It doesn't matter. I'm not really in control of it." And that's a problem. It's, it sort of reminds me of a pastor that was uh, pastor of the church I grew up in. He uh, was a Dallas theological graduate. Uh, he happened to go in the direction of Calvinism and. Unfortunately, uh, when I was about 22 years old, the church underwent a major problem because it was found that he was in an adulterous relationship. And uh, there were two elders from our church that went, knocked on his door, uh, trying to follow through with church discipline and try and bring him back into the faith. And he actually said that to some extent, it would have to be understood that his sin was in light of the sovereignty of God. And that's how far down you can get in the spiral of Calvinist theology. Instead of blaming the devil, we're blaming God for making us do it. Isn't that something? We'll be right back with Dan Gracely on Calvinism, A Closer Look. Many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times. Grave immorality is on the rise, as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements, making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host. And with us is guest Daniel Gracely, author of Calvinism, A Closer Look. And boy, are we taking a closer look. You know, Dan, um, I understand that John Calvin had a view on predestination, sometimes referred to as double predestination. I mean, this is the view that God has actively chosen some people for damnation as well as for salvation. I personally have learned and witnessed that with five-point Calvinism, people who follow that system of belief have a hard time being responsible for their own sinful actions. We did mention that in our last segment. But their response is often, God made me do it, rather than the devil made me do it. Uh, this view is very concerning, Dan. I've heard it over and over again that I committed adultery because God perhaps has another reason for me committing adultery. I've heard those kind of scapegoat uh, issues, you know. But anyway, can you explain to our listeners the connection between foreknowledge versus predestination? Yeah, if you can only read one thing about uh, the whole Calvinist argument, don't read my book. Read an article by Thomas Edgar. Uh, 
on foreknowledge. I think it's still available online. It's free. Just type in Thomas Edgar. That's Edgar as in Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, he's a professor from Capital Bible Seminary, emeritus professor. I'm not even actually certain if he's still living, but wrote a brilliant article on foreknowledge. And he basically says, as a more, sort of somewhat agreed that the foreknowledge is the key to everything. And that's why he addresses it. If you can refute Calvinism uh, on the concept of foreknowledge, in a sense, all the other dominoes fall of Calvinism. So what Edgar points out, first of all, is that in extra-biblical documents, in the Greek of the time, in Jesus' time, and so forth, that the, the, word, the verb to foreknow simply meant to know in advance. It didn't have the Calvinist kind of definition, which is to to determine a thing and on that basis to know something in advance or to love something intimately and and so know in advance that you're chosen and so forth and so on. It doesn't have any of those meanings. And so it's rare that scholars even disagree what the word foreknowledge means in extra biblical documents. And so the problem comes to the New Testament. What does it mean when it's in the New Testament? And uh, Edgar points out that in the New Testament, when Paul uses it, it actually has the same meaning as that used in extra-biblical documents. And so what the Calvinist has to do is something very interesting. And this is what James White, who's a well-known debater for Calvinism, in a 45-minute presentation about Calvinism, in the first, I think, one minute or two minutes, he addresses this problem of foreknowledge. And the way, probably the reason he does is because as any really good debater knows, you have to deal with the opponent's strongest argument first and do away with it, and then you make way for presenting your own view. So here's what uh, White says about foreknowledge. He says, let me just stop long enough to challenge in the minds of anyone who thinks that this term foreknew as a verb is the same thing as the noun, to simply have foreknowledge, that you are wrong and that you need to look at the text of Scripture and realize this is an active verb. This is something God is doing. And every time God is the subject, and this is the verb in the New Testament, the object is personal, it's never actions, to simply say, God knew who was going to believe. There is no example of that statement in the New Testament. It's not there, unquote. Now, what White is doing is he's making an argument of special pleading because he's saying that, well, if this word occurs in the New Testament and God is the subject and it's in reference to people, well, in that case, for no means, blah, 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 blah. And he gives the Calvinist definition. The problem with that is that's a special pleading argument. Look, there's a reason why language has definitions for things. And as Egger points out, if you're going to change the meaning of words depending on what the grammatical subject is or who the grammatical subject is, in this case, God, then you can't really know what any word means when God is the subject. Uh, so that's, that's the problem with foreknowledge is that they're not allowing normal meanings in extra biblical documents and even Paul's usage of it in the New Testament to act as what I would call lexical controls so that you don't have renegade interpretations, which is what they need in order to advance their theology. Um, so once you see that foreknowledge has nothing to do with predetermination and so forth, then it, you can see that if God simply has foreknowledge of what's going to happen, that on that basis, he knows that we're going to believe, that we have free choice, that we're going to persevere in our belief. And so he predestinates us under the conformity of the Son. And that just simply means he knows that that's what we want. And so he's preparing that for us. And so all of these other things, uh, unconditional elect, so-called unconditional election, limited time, irresistible grace, perseverance, all of that changes once you realize that foreknowledge doesn't have the meaning that Calvinists claim it to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know just very simply, Dan, I mean, I read that, you know, we are predestined to conform to the image of God's Son, that's what you said. So it seems to me that God will take all of our uh, circumstances, incidents, whatever we go through, whatever, and He turns them around for good. If we, if we are submitting to His will, if we desire to submit to His Lordship, that He will... Uh, as God said, predestined us to conform to the image of God's Son as we change from glory to glory, you know. And um, so with that said, uh, are you going to move on to predestination, uh, more giving us more of a definition? Yeah, Cindy, it says in Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, remember that simply means that he knew in advance, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And so the predestination isn't unto salvation, it's unto a conformity to the Son. 
And that's what we want as Christians. We ultimately want to be like Christ and one day we'll be like Christ. But along these lines also, adoption is sometimes brought in because that just happens, uh, is discussed six verses in front of predestination, Romans 8, 8, Romans 8, 23, interestingly says, but not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, awaiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So here adoption is not coming into the family of God because it already says, it says right here, we already have the first fruits of the spirit. So it's a result of having the first fruits of the spirits. The, the adoption is really the redemption of our body. The Greek word adoption really comes from son standing. I think the idea what Paul here is saying is a full realization of our salvation, ultimately in the redemption of our body, which of course uh, we won't have until we're with Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Dan, I want to focus on this irresistible grace. I know that um, John 6.44, you were, we were talking about that before. Why don't you uh, reiterate John 6.44 and in, in light of being drawn, you know, how God draws us. I think, I think my experience and being around those that are, and again, I always say five-point Calvinists because I find that uh, those that are hook, line, and sinker, you know, verbatim for the tulip, uh, use certain words like we're drawn and, you know, the sovereignty of God and God made me do it and, and that sort of thing. But I, I know, too, that there are churches that maybe are three-point Calvinists or two-point Calvinists. In other words, they only believe in uh, certain points of Calvinism and not all. But I'm referring to the ones that are five-point Calvinists. Uh, but it seems that this drawing, you know, that only God draws us, that we had nothing to do with, with going to God. And I really want to focus in on that. So what can you tell us about that? So Calvinists often use John 6, 44 to try and prove ir irresistible grace. And let me read it to you here. Mm -hmm. This is from the NASB, mm -hmm. New American Standard Version of the Bible. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, when Jesus talks about who sent me draws him, when he talks about draws him, what the Calvinist does is he goes over to another passage, I think it's in John, where it says that Peter uh, uh, drew the net ashore. Um, the Greek word is helko, and it's translated sometimes as dragged. And so in lexicons who follow, which follow translations, they'll say that the Greek word helko means to drag. So what the Calvinist does is he, say, he says, you see, Peter's dragging the net on the shore. And so the same word is being used here in John 6, 44, which means that God drags us. Now, the problem with that is that a word is not defined by its context. It's defined by its contexts. The problem is you have to look at every context in which a word is used in order to find out what its meaning is. And in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, the Song of Solomon, the maiden says to Solomon, draw me and we will follow after you. The same word there. Now, obviously, she's not talking about being dragged. She's talking about being wooed. And so what happens with lexicons is you'll look up the word and it'll say uh, that helco means to drag uh, or to woo and so forth. The fact is the Greek is not doing that because it's using the same word. So logically, what's happening? Well, it's a less exact word. It's like when we have the word snow and Eskimos have 46 words for mm. different kinds of snow. Uh, they'll know what, we're, what kind of snow we're talking about by the context in which we use the word snow. And even so, in uh, John 6, 44 and Solomon 1, 4, Song of Solomon 1, 4, this word is used. And so what it means is the Greek word simply means to pull. Peter pulled the net ashore. Um, the, uh, the Song of Solomon is the maiden just sim simply saying, pull me, okay? But by dynamic equivalent translation, so-called, uh, these other words are used. And so people think that they actually have these meanings. And so all that John 6.44 is saying is that God is pulling man. And that's what he does. We, we know he does that. We know that's what the Spirit does. He tries to convince us of sin and righteousness and judgment and God is always working, trying to, to pull us. And some people, he more or less does drag, I don't mean irresistibly, into the faith. And some people who lose, you know, there's different personalities. They respond differently. And God responds, I think, accordingly when he tries to draw them. So God is not just dragging everyone, saying, you will believe in me uh, because I'm telling you you will believe in me and I'm dragging you to me is basically what a Calvinist would think, that I had nothing to do with 
with coming to God. He actually elected me. He chose me. He pulled me. He, or more than pulled me, he dragged me to himself. Correct. Well, there's, a, there's, you know, there's an element of human choice in there, as John one twelve says, as many as received him. Yes. And um, it, there's, there's lots of verses that talk about you do it, you do it, you do it, you do it, and we can't simply get rid of the you. Mm-hmm. And pretend that it's 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 a person, and that's what Calvinists do in a lot of instances. Uh, when B.B. Warfield says that God creates the thoughts and intents of the heart, and thinking, well, so what is man apart from what God puts in him? Biology? Uh, it's more or less like a computer that you program and speaks. Uh, the Calvinist description of man is really uh, nothing more than that when he's on the front end of the rocking horse. Of course, when it comes to the back end where he has to explain the problem of evil, then man comes into play. If I can say this much, because uh, this is interesting. Lorraine Bittner actually quotes Martin Luther as saying that free will is an empty term utterly dashed upon the rocks by his way of understanding. It has has you know There is no such thing. And yet 16 pages later in the same book, Lorraine Bittner says that, uh, you know, despite all these things, nevertheless, man is free to choose if he is permitted to do so. So after he initially quoted Martin Luther saying that it's not even possible to have free will choice, 16 pages later, he's saying the exact opposite. That's Mm -hmm. why I'm saying when you put the statements together, you actually end up with no meaning. And when you have no meaning, you've undone language, you've unsaid language, and ultimately, it's really a denial of Christ is the word isn't it? Because he's the communicator from God to us about the good news of how we can receive the forgiveness of sins. We'll be right back with Dan Gracely, so please stay tuned. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host. Love for the Truth programs also air on KRURLP. That's 103.9 FM. Atascadero, California. Log on to RadioRefuge.net. That's Radio Refuge. Dot net Wednesday 12 p.m. Saturday 3 p.m. Sunday 2 a.m. Pacific time. You can hear us there as well. Uh, you know, Dan, I I need to wrap this up, wrap my brain around it, um, just to go over some of the things that you said. So, from my understanding and from my own experience, uh, walking through this Calvinistic type of, of view, being at a five point Calvinistic church, although I didn't really ever buy into it. I didn't realize that they were teaching it, though, that really we are so depraved that when, that only, wait, let me back up, we are so depraved that only God can impute faith in us to even have faith in Him. You know, that's kind of what I understand that Calvin's think. And also that grace is so irresistible that God has to drag us to Himself even against our own will. And that we are predestined to either be chosen for heaven and be saved, or we're predestined to go to hell. And so, I mean, I look at this and I say, you know what? I wouldn't want to worship a God that made me worship him that way. There's no way. To me, that's total abuse. That you're going to, I'm going to make you love me. I'm going to, you have your, you don't have any thoughts of your own. I'm going to impute thoughts in your brain. And and if you do something wrong and you sin, it's because God told me to do it. You know, I would not want to worship a God like that. And that's not the God that I serve. As far as I'm concerned, five-point Calvinism is indeed a false gospel. You know, I see my father God as a good dad. You know, that punishes us when we get off a little bit or, but you know, we have our own will 
Um, I, you know, having my own children, I'm not going to make them love me, you know, and I just don't see God like that. I wouldn't want to worship a God like that. And here's the other thing. If we are predestined to conform to the image of God's son, then apparently we should be able to think like God's son, uh, we can think for ourselves and we can decide whether we're going to be obedient to God the Father, Jesus being our Lord and example, or we're not going to, we're going to be rebellious kids. I mean, to me, it's very, very practical. When we see God in light of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a very simple, a very practical uh, gospel, and we can relate to it because we can relate in a way that uh, he's a good father that he sacrificed his only son on our behalf, and that Jesus loved his dad so much that he laid down his life to glorify him. And, you know, I see him as a good dad. Uh, in light of Calvinism, it makes him seem like he's a big, harsh God out there that only wants to glorify himself. Yeah, I agree, Cindy. You know, Jesus described uh, God uh, by talking to his audience. He said, what father is there among you whom if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent? That's, we're told that in Luke 11. And uh, so God is not just an initiator, he's a responder. He's obviously not imputing thoughts to his son to ask for bread or to ask for a fish. God is understood in, in normal human terms uh, much of the time. It's true that God is transcendent to us. He says, my ways and thoughts are higher than yours, as high as the heavens are to the earth. But God is describing that in terms of degree, not He's drawing a difference in degree, not in fundamental kind. And that's the problem is that Calvinists tend to describe God in, in, as a fundamental, uh, fundamentally different person, transcendent to the point where we can't really understand him. James Spiegel in his book, The Benefits of Providence, talks about God not even having emotion and being outside time and all these other things. Listen, the Bible never talks about God being outside time. Whenever God is talked about, there's always tense involved. And this is because God lives moment by moment himself with different thoughts, different choices, Christ himself said, could I not now call for 12 legions of angels and my father would send them to me? It shows that Christ had the ability to break scripture. He told Peter that, but he decided not to. And because there's choice and because there's thought on a continual moment by moment basis, this is the nature of reality. It's not it's not what Calvinists believe when they talk about God being outside time and doesn't have any emotion and all these other things. In fact, we know from Genesis that God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And that never changed because after the flood, God said, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, which showed that God still recognized that man was made in his image, even though it says that Seth was also made in Adam's image. So there's something added, and that was the addition to a knowledge that Adam acquired in sin. But I wanted to talk about uh, John Piper for a moment, if I can, Cindy, and uh, his view of God as being self-centered. So John Piper says this, quote, God is the one being in the entire universe for whom self-centeredness or the pursuit of his own glory is the ultimately loving act. For him, self-exaltation is the highest virtue. Now, to me, I don't see anything of the, of the Trinity of God. I'm not saying that if John Piper were pressed, or perhaps in other writings, he might not mention the Trinity, and obviously there are different roles. But I don't know how you could have a high view of the Trinity, of the persons of the, that make up the Godhead, and say such a thing, that God is the one being who's after self-centeredness and the pursuit of his own glory. In fact, God, may, God the Father makes it clear that his desire was that the Son be glorified. And Jesus said, Father, glorify me so that I may glorify you. The motive of the Son was not to bring glorification to himself. In fact, he says, I came not on my own. He says it two or three times, at least in the Gospels. It really wasn't his idea. In fact, in my opinion, Jesus came as a reluctant Messiah. He was probably the type of son who may even initially have said to his father, no, I don't want to do this, but ultimately changed his mind and did the Father's will, even as the parable of the son who told his father he wasn't going to go out in the field and work, but changed his mind and went and did the will of the father. And so uh, John Piper, it, it really has a, a monist view of God when he talks about God as one being. This is similar really to Allah, and uh, who's considered by Islam as one singular being. And th th the problem with that is if you go with that, then prior to creation, you have a God of whom there is no one else. And the problem with that is that a singular being all by himself is not capable of selfishness or selflessness because that requires in another. But you see, when we understand the triunity of the Godhead and the persons of the Trinity, then 
the fact is, from all eternity past, there was always the possibility that one of the persons could descend from the other in what he wanted, what he decided, and these other things. The, the genius of the Godhead is that he's, he, he goes into conference with different desires, but he comes out with the same decision. And Piper misses this, and it's, it's, I think it's a big problem for Calvinism, because who wants to serve a God who's all about himself and you know, is out for his own self-glorification and all those things? Piper thinks it's okay because he's the creator. Uh, it's just unbiblical theology, and it's, it just, in my opinion, destroys the, the concept of the Trinity, which is what draws people. The idea that God is self-sacrificial, that God gave up the Son to the world so that the world might be saved. And that the Son might give glory to the Father. And then of the Holy Spirit, it says he will not testify of himself, but of what he sees and hears. So the Holy Spirit is not out about self-glorification of his own, of his own person among the Trinity. It's, it's, it's mutually self-sacrificial for the other. Yeah, amen to that. And you know, Dan, can we um, now compare Calvinism with the gospel that was once delivered to the saints so that our listeners can kind of have a summary of what we've been talking about this whole entire show? Calvinism in its purest form preaches a different gospel. It says you do not generate your own thoughts or choices. They're done for you. God does them for you. But John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will have everlasting life. And in Romans 4, the apostle Paul talks about Abraham and how he had faith and that God honored that faith so that he became saved and it was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. And this brings us back to the five points of Calvinism. T, total depravity. Uh, yeah, Abraham was bad, but he still had the ability to choose. He had the ability to have faith in God. And so however bad we are, we can still respond. You know, sometimes Calvinists bring up Ephesians too, and they point out that we're dead in sins. And so they say, oh, you're just so dead in sins, you can't possibly respond. Uh, so God creates all these desires in you and, the po- and makes you believe and, and imputes faith and so forth and so on. The problem there is that Paul also says that not only are we dead to sins, but when he speaks of the believer, he says we're alive in Christ. Well, we know that being alive in Christ, we still have the capability of sin. So by the same token, we should not describe being dead in sins as so radical that we cannot choose. Paul's not making the point that we can't choose. He's making the point that we can choose. So being dead in sins, you can still choose to do some things that are good. Even people who don't believe can still love their neighbor as themselves sometimes, although they never really do it with the motive of glorifying God. So not in every respect are they guilty. They do some things that are good and will not be punished for ways in which they love their neighbor for themselves. Oftentimes people do this when there's a car accident or something like that. And they, they see that someone's in help and they stop and they take care of it. Uh, U stands for unconditional election. Um, one of the most frequent quoted arguments uh, from Calvinists is that uh, God says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And that all this was done before either of them were born. They didn't have anything to do with it and so forth and so on. But this has to be understood in the context of Romans 4, which precedes Romans 9 and about Abrahamic faith. What God is saying is that he foreknows, he knows in advance that Jacob is going to exhibit the type of Abrahamic faith so that he will be saved. And that's why God had a special relationship with Israel. In Deuteronomy, I believe it says that God loved the Israelites because of their forefathers, because of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, L stands for limited atonement. Uh, Calvinists don't believe that Christ died for everyone, but clearly from 1 John 4, verse 14, it says that Christ is the Savior of the world. And the word world there has to be interpreted in the same sense it is in all other 21 appearances in that book. I stands for irresistible grace. And we've talked about John 6, 44 and the drawing of God, of man to his son. But in the whole context of John Six is about receiving manna. This is something that people did voluntarily. Um, They did have livestock that they ate and so forth and so on. But if they wanted manna, they had to get out of their tent and they had to go get the manna. God didn't make the manna appear in their stomach. He didn't impute manna into the digestive system. It was something that they had to voluntarily react to. It wasn't irresistible. They had a choice that was involved. P is for perseverance of the saints. You know, in, 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 the, in hyper-Calvinism, uh, the purest form of Calvinism, God decides whether you overcome. You have no choice in the matter. This is why Harold Camping was never really sure whether or not he was saved or not, because he couldn't be sure whether or not God was going to do the overcoming for him. But the fact is, Revelation repeatedly says, when Christ gives messages to the church, that 
We need to overcome. We need to do it. And of course, God helps us do that. The Spirit helps us do that. That's, that's His role. Um, but still, we, we, have, we do have a role in that, and uh, we have a responsibility to overcome. So we are free will beings. We do have a choice. We have a responsibility to respond to Christ, whom God has given to us, to save us from our sins. And it's important we do that, and Calvinism does not preach that in any way, shape, or form. It undoes language, it unsays language, and it denies the gospel. Does, does that and again, you know, our relationship is with the Lord. Is, is well, it's very relational. Uh, you know that we do have choices. You know, Dan, I do think about uh, even in in the Israelites or in the Old Testament, it says, "Choose ye this day, blessing or cursing." You know, so He's asking. God is yes. always asking us to make a choice, and we do have a choice. We have a break coming up, so please stay tuned for Dan Gracely. He'll give you his final thoughts and contact information. So please stay tuned. back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host for Love for the Truth Radio Philadelphia. Look us up on lovefortheTruthRadio.com. We air programs via stream every day. You can find program archives uh, with contributors John Haller, Chris Quintana, Carl Tycrib, Patrick Wood, guests like Bill Koenig, Ray Youngin, Johanna Michelson, Bill Salas, and Jan Markell, and many more veterans of the faith with the voice of truth. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and on Rapture Ready Radio on Monday evenings on Blog Talk Radio with Jackie Alnor, along with numerous web radio programs who air us on their stations worldwide. Welcome back. You know, Dan, you've given us a wealth of information. In fact, there's so much information. You should see his book, Calvinism, A Closer Look. I mean, this thing is so thick. It's, it, it, it touches everything. It's got over 700 pages involved here with uh, everything you can think of. So if you're interested, make sure you look up Calvinism, A Closer Look by Daniel Gracely on Amazon. That's Calvinism, A Closer Look by Daniel Gracely on Amazon. Uh, Dan, you know, if somebody's attending a church, um, you know, sometimes it's really hard because I know I was in the same situation. It's really hard to determine if it's a five-point Calvinist church, especially if, if you've heard the same things over and over and you, you don't know that it's the wrong gospel. What are some of the red flag words that are constantly being said that maybe, um, you know, someone would be hearing that they can determine that it is, in fact, a Calvinistic church? Well, probably the chief word is sovereign. You'll hear the word that God is sovereign. And it doesn't mean that God isn't the ultimate uh, judge of the universe. He is. And God's judgment is irresistible and will be one day for every unbeliever. But if you hear sovereign a lot and and the emphasis on human choice, that's a red flag. Another red flag is you'll hear the word control. That's used a lot, that God is in control. And that's kind of dancing around the bushes. That's not stating it as baldly as what they think that's that's really a red f- that would be a red flag for me i think probably the wisest thing is to simply go up to your pastor and ask him if he's a calvinist or if he's not or exactly what he believes on these five points then there's no question about it and um if if, if after you pray you feel that you maybe should start looking for another church i would um sometimes there's not another church in the area so that might create a dilemma but um, God will help you one way or another. Mm-hmm. And pray a lot, too. Uh, Dan, how can someone get in contact with you if they have any uh, questions? Probably my email is the easiest. It's my name, all one word, Daniel Gracely. Gracely is spelled like the word grace, L-Y, at gmail.com. All right, great. And where can they get your book? Uh, at Amazon. Okay. Just look up Calvinism, A Closer Look, and it's available there in ebook format and also soft cover. Okay, well thank you so much Daniel Gracely. Uh, we have a lot to think about. Thank you audience. Stay tuned for next week. We'll see you then. God bless. <laughs>